What first drew me to visit the parish church of St. Cuthbert in Edinburgh was its connection to mathematician John Napier. He was a member here, he served as elder here, and he is buried here. I've now visited more than a dozen times over the last seven years, and the church itself, its beauty, its history, have also captured me for their own sake. So this video, while it is motivated by interest in John Napier, is very focused on the church itself, a very worthy and interesting place to visit. The founding of St. Cuthbert's, a church standing in the shadow of Edinburgh Castle, goes back 13 centuries. In other words, it's well over a thousand years old. The current building does not go back that far, having been demolished and rebuilt several times. Most of the current structure dates back to the 1890s. The tower is older, dating to the 1700s, but even that part of the structure doesn't date back to Napier, who died in 1617. The history of this church does go back further than other ancient churches in Edinburgh, such as St. Giles Cathedral, St. Margaret's Chapel, and Greyfriars Kirk. Here are some images of various buildings the congregation has worshipped in over the centuries. Images from a binder in the church's little museum and gift shop, which you can sometimes find open during the week. One of the reasons that the church has had to be rebuilt so many times is its location. Residing at the base of Castle Rock is beautiful but it also means the church has been right in the line of fire during times of war. Because of this, it ended up damaged or destroyed four times between the 14th and 17th centuries. Due to the multiple rebuildings, the exact location of John Napier's grave is no longer known, but there is a marble tablet honoring him in the vestibule. The tablet contains a Latin inscription, a bust of Napier, Napier's motto, Prudentia et Simplicitate. It was put up in 1842, during the time of Mark Napier, who wrote a biography of his illustrious ancestor. I did mention and picture this church and tablet in a previous video that I made on memorials to John Napier. I'll link that video above and in the description in case you'd like to see other Napier memorials. Oh, and in case you're visiting here and looking for this one, it's in the vestibule or foyer directly to the left as you face the doors into the sanctuary. When I first visited, I had a very hard time finding it. I was looking all over inside the sanctuary and didn't think to look out in the foyer. St. Cuthbert's has sometimes been called the West Kirk because it is at the western end of central Edinburgh just to the west of Prince's Street Gardens. These gardens used to be a lake, or loch, known as the Norloch. We can see the Norloch in one of the older images posted earlier. One of the newer additions to the church is a memorial chapel dedicated to the sons of this congregation who lost their lives in World War I. There is a connection between this church and a church in Jerusalem, and the gold tile here in the chapel is from Jerusalem. Another connection with Jerusalem is that holy water is sent here from there. I'm not sure if they still do this, but they used to hold evening services in this chapel that included a ministry of prayer for healing, and I think that this holy water was used in such services. Another fact about this chapel is that Agatha Christie was married here to her second husband in September of 1930. Another memorial in the church is in the form of a Tiffany stained glass window, one of only three Tiffany windows in all of Scotland. This window memorializes those who fought and died in the Boer War. The window definitely stands out, looking rather different from the other stained glass windows in the church. It can be found on the north side of the church, near the back. 
There are multitudes of churches in Edinburgh, and I've visited quite a few, but I consider St. Cuthbert's to be my church home while I'm in town. Having visited here so many times and worshipped here so many times, I've been able to connect with local musicians, which has provided me with entry to certain places that the general public doesn't normally get to see. One of these is the organ loft, and the other is the bell tower. I not only got to see them, but got to engage with them, which has provided me with some very precious memories. Here are some views of the organ and organ loft, and also views from the organ loft. Some pictures I took from the organ loft are at strange angles or are out of focus. That's because it's a tight squeeze up there, and it was challenging to try to turn around and take photos from that space. And there's no room behind the bench to stand. I've been told this is the largest organ in Edinburgh in terms of number of stops, having two more than the organ at St. Giles Cathedral. I haven't been able to confirm that independently, Seems right, though, despite some of the other churches having a more massive display of pipes. As to the bells, I arrived early for practice, so I got to go up above the ringing chamber to the bell chamber itself. This involved not only the staircase and spiral stairs, but also two completely vertical ladders right up against the wall, which I found rather difficult to ascend. On the floor between the two vertical ladders is where the clock mechanism resides. My pictures of the bells are fuzzy because I was clinging to a ladder while twisting my body 180 degrees to look behind myself and using my camera with one hand while doing so. It was awkward, but very cool to see where everything was and how it connected. I had never seen bell music before, and as a mathematician, I was very interested in the patterns involved. Coincidentally, a few years after this visit, I attended a math talk on bell ringing that put it in the context of group theory. The talk was especially meaningful to me, having previously had this experience. Over the years, the ringers here have carried out some special peals for special occasions some of these lasting multiple hours. That is a long time to be performing a piece of music, and especially hard to try to perform without error. I can't imagine how much practice went into that. There are not many churches in Edinburgh, or in all of Scotland for that matter, where peals are rung, so this is very special, and I admire the people who keep up this tradition. On one of my early visits back in 2017, I came out at night to listen to practice and took a bit of video. It was kind of creepy to be in the kirkyard at night, but well worth it. The kirkyard is very atmospheric. Nobody does graveyards like Scotland. I have a dark side and I love this, but even I have to admit that I prefer to visit during daylight hours. The carvings and sculpture are fascinating. And the inscriptions can be quite interesting as well. Some are comforting, and some come across as a bit threatening. Well, perhaps not threatening, but certainly a reminder to make the most of the time we have. burials have taken place in this kirkyard for more than a thousand years, but the oldest gravestone still standing in the kirkyard goes back to just over 400 years ago, dated 1606. So the oldest stones predate the time of John Napier's death, but he would have been buried inside the church, which is why, due to its many rebuildings, the exact location of his tomb is no longer known. 
There's a watchtower in the kirkyard that was built in 1827, a time when those called resurrection men were digging up fresh bodies to sell for use in anatomy classes. Medicine was advancing, and there was a chronic shortage of bodies for dissection. I've seen many other cemeteries and kirkyards in Edinburgh with such towers to guard against this grave robbing, which seems to have been a widespread problem. At that time, the law only allowed bodies of certain people to be used for dissection, bodies of executed criminals or of people who had committed suicide, for example. Thankfully, laws have changed since that time, allowing for people to donate their bodies to science. On a lighter note, St. Cuthbert's Kirkyard is home to the sculpture of a dog named Bum, a famous dog from San Diego, California. Both San Diego and Edinburgh have celebrity dogs, and this sculpture was gifted to the people of Edinburgh by the people of San Diego in 2008 as a commemoration of their sister city status. There is also a sculpture of Edinburgh's famous Greyfriars Bobby in San Diego. Again, while my first visit here was prompted by my interest in mathematician John Napier, I have found so many additional reasons to come back to St. Cuthbert's time and time again. The entire city of Edinburgh is absolutely jam-packed with fascinating history and beautiful sights, but even just this one site contains so very much to explore. Sadly, as with so many historical churches in Edinburgh, the size of the congregation is dwindling. They may need to combine with another congregation in the near future in order to survive, which means that worship may or may not continue at this location. I imagine that the structure and grounds would remain and would be repurposed for community use, possibly as a venue for art or music or other events, but I can't help but find it incredibly sad that, after a history of more than a thousand years, worship here may soon come to an end. For now at least, the congregation still sings, the organ still sounds, and the bells still ring out over the bones of old John Napier. <laughs>